So, the individual differences area, uh, Nation of Morons by Gould, 1982. It will become clear why it's called that. Um, remember, the key theme is measuring differences. So, uh, one of the strengths of the individual differences area is it's come up with ways of measuring differences, such as identifying schizophrenia, measuring who's got schizophrenia, who hasn't, or depression, or who hasn't, and those kind of things. But this study is very much down the lines of warning, warning about how we measure differences and, and the impact of that that can have on um, social control issues. So this is Gould. He was depicted in The Simpsons. He made it to The Simpsons. He was, uh, I think, a paleontologist or uh, maybe not, maybe an ethnographer. He wasn't strictly a psychologist, but um, did analyze uh, other psychologists' work, which is what he's doing here. Um, so let's go iq testing if you google iq test this is a google uh, i clicked iq test in, in google and clicked on images there's all the kind of stuff that comes in uh, we all like to do iq tests and we all like to find out what iq we've got um well if if it's above average but not not if it's below average so um lots and lots of ways of measuring iq but are any of them valid uh, is a different question so, two conflicting views on intelligence is nature and nurture. Nurture, that intelligence can be seen as a system of living and acting operations. So, in other words, it's dynamic and it isn't fixed or stable. Continuously adapts itself to new environmental stimuli. So, Piaget uh, was an advocate of this. So, in other words, you could do an IQ test one week and then you could practice IQ tests for a week and be better at an IQ test next week in which case your IQ can change it's not just fixed if intelligence is learned we aren't testing an unchanging thing but something that's a product of a person's experience in which case one should be able to enhance a person's experience in such a way that their intelligence increases so the behaviorists as well would say um, so John uh, John Watson said, "Give me a baby, and I'll give you either a genius or a beggar or a thief." So, in other words, you can create a genius according to nurture and according to the behaviorists. On the opposite side, you've got nature. Uh, intelligence is innate; it's an innate cognitive ability that's fixed and stable from birth. So, you genetically inherit your intelligence. If intelligence is innate and unchanging, then the point of testing is to classify people. So intelligence tests are there so that we can um, quantify people into groups of intelligent, not intelligent. Perhaps it's into people who should be uh, given extra resources at school, people who are uh, geniuses in the making who should be uh, encouraged into particular positions. And on the flip side, if you're not a bright spark then you should be pushed in another direction so quite, quite controversial and um, there is a lot of kind of genetic studies recent studies that say that uh, your intelligence your, your gen genetic intelligence actually hits later in life so you take twin studies the twins have been separated at birth they can begin being very different in intelligence but then when they hit adulthood they can end up being very similar intelligence um, however there are problems with studies like that about genetic research and correlations are often used so Simon Binet in 1905 um, Simon I just said Simon Binet it's not Simon Binet it's Simon and Binet really um, they came up with uh, the idea of IQ intelligence quotient so that is your mental age times 100 divided by your chronological age the reason for that is they said it's it's reasonable to say that if you test a five-year-old then you can't judge them off a 50 year old's ability to perform an IQ test so it should be their mental age divided by what their actual age is their chronological age so let's say they score five on the IQ test the mental age of five and their chronological age is five and you times that by a hundred then you get five um, sorry you get a hundred one times a hundred so the average IQ is seen as a hundred because it's your 
mental age divided by chronological age. So anything above 100 and you're seen as being above average. Anything below, you're seen as below average. And there's different categories beneath there, like below average and then retarded and morons and those kind of lovely uh, categories that have been misused as insults over the years. Now this guy, Robert Yerkes, he was an early psychologist knocking around in the 1910s, 20s, 30s. And he um, was trying to get psychology into the war. He brought psychology into the war. And there's a reason for that, which was the point of this study. I'm just going to show you the, this is the original article of Yerkes in The New Scientist, 1982. And it's a good read, actually, if you can dig it out. Um, I like the first sentence. Robert M. Yerkes was about to turn 40 when he... Uh, wh who was about to turn 40? He was a frustrated man in 1915. He had been the, on the faculty of Harvard University since 1902. He was a superb organizer of men, an eloquent promoter of his profession. Yet, psychology still wallowed in its reputation as a soft science, if a science at all. So, Yerkes wished above all to promote his, his profession, to establish his profession. Now, there's nothing more dangerous than someone who's trying to prove themselves as being scientific and being and and that word prove comes along um trying to prove that that you are extremely rigorous science but when you get into psychology when you're measuring people's brains then it's far more difficult to quantify things so robert yerkes gould says and remember gould is the researcher that you're looking at at the moment but gould is talking about robert yerkes's research and so he's reviewing Yerkes' research. He was a frustrated man in 1915. Gould is writing in 1982. So what do we know about him? Harvard Uni, um, it was seen as a soft science. And so he wanted to improve the status, making it objective and quantifiable. And he also believed, unfortunately for many people, as you'll see later, that intelligence was inherited and therefore was due to nature. So if you mix these two ideas together, he wants to prove A, that intelligence is inherited and genetic, and B, that you can test and that it's quantifiable and psychology is very scientific. This is going to lead to difficulties with his conclusions, so we'll have a look. Believed that he could show his, degree, his ideas of inherited intelligence and began testing uh, recruits for the, the American army. The World War I provided this magical uh, opportunity for Yerkes because he had over a million participants that he could test and he could ask the army to carry out these intelligence tests and you've got a captive audience. So sufficient data to show that intelligence testing was scientific. So if he can say that look at these differences between groups then uh, over such a large sample, then that's a very strong scientific argument. Unfortunately, looking ahead here, he started to categorize people based on race, black, white, or Eastern European, and started to prove with millions of participants who was the most intelligent. And unsurprisingly, the white people, he was white, um, became most intelligent. So, let's see. There's huge problems with this. Study summarizes an article written by Gould who explored the methodology used by Yerkes, who published this in 1921, and also the implications of his research. So, there we go. Nearest recruiting station, go get yourself IQ tested. Aims. Gould aimed to identify the following issues in Yerkes' work. So, the problematic nature of psychometric testing in general as a measure of intelligence. So Gould generally does not like the idea of psychometric testing. Measuring people based on self-reports. The problem of theoretical bias influencing research. The problem of political and ethical implications of research. And in this case, the use of biased data discriminate between people in suitability for occupation and even admission to a country. So these findings, just to jump ahead, stopped people from entering America and stopped certain people from getting jobs. And that was largely based on race. 
So mix all those together, you've got problems of measuring IQ, problems of bias in research, and the socially sensitive nature of particular pieces of research like this. You aim to identify the following issues in Yerkes' work. So, the, uh, I've just said all three of those. Excuse me, let's continue. Good. Like, research methods. Um, the research method, it's, remember Gould isn't an empirical piece of research. In other words, he's not carrying it out. He's not, as in, he's not doing an experiment. He's not going and doing the tests. It's important to be aware that the article is an edited extract from Gould's 1981 book, The Mismeasure of Man. So he's written a, a whole book about how intelligence measuring in the 19th century uh, is similar to craniology, which was basically, you know, figuring out someone's shape of their skull and then saying whether they're going to be a criminal. It was, it was phrenology, it was craniology. So he's saying that this was kind of the new version of really bad science. It was a whole book that he wrote on it. And that article that I just showed you uh, was an edited version from that book. So it particularly focused on the chapter on uh, Yerkes' work. It's therefore a review article. This kind of method is known as a review article. When you look back at something and you review it. Often review articles are done when, say, you want to find out the best treatment for depression instead of carrying out your own research you might look at a hundred pieces of research on Google Scholar and summarize all of those that have already been carried out and bring together research from across the world so review articles can be um, anything where you look back at, at previous research and draw some conclusions the sample World War one recruits 1.75 million army recruits in the USA during World War One. The recruits included white Americans, Negroes as they call them, and European immigrants. Opportunity sample, situated in training camps, adult men. So the training camps for World War One. Procedure, May to July 1917. So we're the year before the, the, the war ended. Yerkes, together with a number of colleagues who shared views on hereditary nature intelligence, wrote army mental tests. Okay, together they developed the three types of tests. First two could be given to large groups and took less than an hour to complete. Okay, but there was a third test as well, which was for people who couldn't read or write. Yerkes had argued that his tests measured native intellectual ability, in other words, innate intelligence. Okay, and you can decide for yourself whether you think these tests measure innate intelligence. So IQ that is not affected by culture or education. Let's wait and see. So here are the tests. Army Alpha Test, the first test. That was for literate recruits consisted of eight parts so they could read and write it included items with which we are totally familiar as part of intelligence testing so things like words in sequence filling in the next number in the sequence those kind of things that if you've ever done an IQ test you you know it required a good basic understanding of English language skills and literacy a very important thing the second test, I think I said before that both of the first two were literate. They, they weren't. The second test were, was for people who were illiteral, uh, illiteral, illiterate, like I am illiterate, um, or failed the army alpha test. Okay, so anyone who said they couldn't read or write, or anyone who failed the first test, had seven parts and consisted of pictures complete uh, picture completion task so complete in a maze a number of tasks picture complete a picture task so these kind of things what's missing from there what's missing from that what's missing from this picture what's missing from this picture um, and there we've got the alpha and the beta tests complete the numbers um, convert the numbers to symbols those kind of things if recruits failed on the other two tests, so if they failed the picture test and the written test, they were supposed to be given an individual spoken examination. However, this rarely happened. So we've snuck in a criticism there already, but it rarely happened. We shall continue in part two.